to know we will be getting started momentarily. Please hold the line. Thank you very much.
Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the NACP Virtual Town Hall Program. My name is Abba Blankson. I'm the Senior Vice President for Marketing. Tonight, our special guest will give us the legal perspective on all of the challenges we are facing as a nation. If you want to stay involved with the work of the NACP or to support our work, you can dial star 8 or go to NACP.org to volunteer. If you're on the phone with us tonight, if you have a question, you can start three, question two. And if you're watching us on social media, you can leave us a question at NAACP. With that, I'd like to turn it over to NAACP President and CEO, Eric Johnson. President Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Abba. And I want to thank everyone who's joining us this evening for what I look for to be a very productive conversation. Uh, a few weeks ago, corporate America woke up and realized that racism actually exists in America. Uh, it is a reality that most of us who are African Americans, we have lived, we have experienced, we, we have heard the stories from our families, and we have hoped that our children and our grandchildren would not face the same reality. Uh, this evening, we have a panel of very distinguished individuals who happen to be women, strong women, who have been charged in carrying out the responsibility to ensure equal protection under the law is afforded uh, not only to everyone in this nation, but especially our community. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over uh, to our host, uh, Sonny Holston, for what I look to be a very productive and insightful uh, conversation. Sonny, thank you for joining us. I think your sound is off. Oh boy. <laughs> so as we get Sunny back up, I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, uh, New York Attorney General Letitia James. Uh, we also have Rachel Rollins, District Attorney for the state of Massachusetts, uh, Suffolk County. as well as Marilyn Mosby, District Attorney for the City of Baltimore. I'm going to ask us to start with Attorney General James to give a few opening reflections on what she has thought about the last few weeks. First, I hope Sunny comes back on. But um, let me first say our nation and my city of New York and the state of New York and cities and states across this country have reached a tipping point of anger and frustration after years of racial, racially charged police violence. Our streets are reeling, the pain and frustration and the loss of black life is devastating. And uh, I know all of us understand and feel the pain and recognize that the time for change is now. We are a nation of laws and a nation of values. And it is our values that drive our law and our government. And the failure to do so is what has led to where we are today with millions of individuals marching on our street. We have also, also seen the fault lines uh, along race, which highlight the dramatic imbalance of the health impacts of COVID-19. And we are also confronting the pandemic of racism. This is a battle we've been waging since uh, the first slave ship landed on the shores of Virginia 400 years ago. Some have called slavery and racism America's original sin. And through generations of struggle and sacrifice, we've come a mighty long way, but our work is yet, yet done. And so while George Floyd's death has lit the spark for change, it is just the latest in a long list of racially charged killings of African-Americans. This never ending cycle of needless death has awakened the conscience of America and indeed the entire world. As the Attorney General of the State of New York, it is my responsibility to defend, protect, and to guard those individuals who peacefully want to protest on their streets. I urge them to continue to protest because all change usually happens with individuals who are protesting, not with elected officials, not with activists, 
but individuals who are on the street marching with their feet and praying with their feet, demanding change. And I stand with them. Thank you so much, A.G. Dame. Thank you so much for those comments. I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Alfreda Robinson, the president of the National Bar Association for some opening reflections. Uh, good evening. I wanna thank uh, the NAACP for uh, convening this very powerful and significant uh, discussion. Uh, we know that we are in the midst of two pandemics and it is highlighted uh, for us uh, all of the years uh, when we really uh, were caught up in a moment where we didn't know we couldn't breathe. Uh, but the recent murders by uh, police and vigilantes of those members of our community have made us realize that we're facing some significant unfinished business. This is a moment in America where we are moving into territory of unfinished business to create for us a more perfect union. Black lawyers are at the forefront. We've always been the NAACP lawyers, the National Bar Association lawyers. And what we do as lawyers, Black lawyers, is to make perfect and permanent that which the people seek in terms of equality and in terms of their piece of the democratic process. And then for all Americans, we right now face a structure that, that has kept us bound just as if there had not been any changes that we achieved during the civil rights movement. It is uh, the lawyers, the black lawyers that have always been at the forefront, normally alone, but virtually alone. And the black lawyers speak to black Americans from where black Americans are about a shared experience in America. And there's one other thing I wanna note. We're also in the face of a um, national, um, federal government that has uh, significantly, significantly eroded democratic principles, laws, and norms. But we are very, very optimistic that we are going to break down these systematic institutional barriers to racial equality for us everywhere in the courtrooms, in the courthouses, in the corporate booths, in law schools, everywhere. We are going to make this America, America that allows all of us to thrive economically. We know that we can do this. We are happy to be in the, in, in the vanguard of this movement and ready to continue the fight for our communities. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Mosby, a few reflections from you. So first and foremost, I, I think like any American, I, I, I continue to be utterly sickened when time and time again, we watch as our sons, our brothers, our fathers, our uncles, our aunts, our sisters, our mothers, our, our kid on camera being killed um, and brutalized by those that are to be protect and uphold the law. Um, the fact that we are constantly um, begging for police, for systems of, of, of racial inequality to see us and our humanity. Um, I, I, I'm encouraged by the moment in that you, you cannot underestimate the power and, of, and discretion of a prosecutor to apply one standard of justice. But in order to define justice, you have to know what injustice is. And injustice, justice does not look like 
passing, allegedly passing a counterfeit $20 bill during a global pandemic in order to buy groceries and you end up dead. Justice doesn't look like failing to put on a turn signal and, and you end up being hung in your cell. It, justice doesn't look like sitting in a drive-thru sleeping and, 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 and you end up dead. Justice doesn't look like allegedly passing and, and selling a loose cigarette and you end up dead it's justice is the mission of a prosecutor over convictions and applying that one standard of justice is something that everybody within this criminal justice system it, it, it hopes for and i think that what we saw in the past month with the number of deaths that we've seen is an exacerbation of distrust of an, a system that was perpetuated by my colleague in Minneapolis who came out and was giving every reason why he could not do his job and apply that one standard of justice. That is what we're fighting for. That is what these protesters who are the real leaders in this country as we lack uh, the, the proper leadership on the federal level are demanding for change. And so I'm encouraged by this moment where we now have iPhones and smartphones that have started and sparked a, a movement like televisions did in the civil rights movement where we could no longer deny the racism that was broadcast on the screens as fire hoses and dogs were imposed upon children seeking the right to merely exist, coexist as equals. People can no longer deny the racism that is perpetuated in the culture of policing in this country. And I'm encouraged by that lifting of the veil of ignorance. But it's time to move from protest to policy. There are systems in place that prevent police accountability in this country that have to be addressed. And it does not relate to competency of prosecutors. It does not relate when people have the courage to do their jobs. And I, I know this firsthand, you're mocked, you're ridiculed, you're harassed, I was sued. My competency was called into question for years, right? Their, their hate mail and death threats, that should not exist. It does, but recognizing that it does, that power of getting to the ballot and understanding the importance of this upcoming election on these local elections and local sheriffs, local mayors, local district attorneys, state's attorney's offices, we have got to go from the streets into the polls and into those booths and make a difference. Thank you, Ms. Lizzie. And as we get Ms. Hoskin back, Ms. Hoskin, if you are on mute, you can go off mute. We will hear from Ms. Uh, Rachel Rollins with some opening reflections. Thank you. Um, I'm heartbroken and furious and honestly, completely exhausted. I see history repeating itself over and over. George Floyd, Rihanna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Eric Gardner, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, and on the other side, we have Christian Cooper and Omar Jimenez, who, although they lived through their encounters, we see not just the microaggressions, but the aggressions of white people against just people with black or brown skin. The list of names is thousands long and centuries old. Black lives not just lost, but stolen, ripped from us. We must confront our past in order to build a more just and equitable future. We need to do the work. We need to have honest and incredibly uncomfortable conversations. Racism is not only this country's original sin, it is our mutating virus. We went from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration and police brutality. Racism is not the product of just a few bad apples. It is the result of carefully crafted systems that were designed to control, monitor, and punish black and brown bodies. The system is working exactly as it was designed. And as black people, what is most hurtful and above and beyond the murders, everything else, just as hurtful is we pay into this system. 
Our tax dollars pay for your DAs. They pay for your mayors and your police departments. And we are getting the short end of the stick in every single circumstance. As a newly elected district attorney, I ran on a platform where there were 15 levels of nonviolent, non-serious crimes that in the first instance, I was not going to prosecute because overwhelmingly those people had food or housing insecurity, a, a, a substance use disorder or a mental health issue. And if we look at George Floyd and the fact that that man lost his life for a counterfeit $20 bill, his life was not even worth $20. And Derek Chauvin, I will not call him an officer. It dishonors the word officer. Derek Chauvin in eight minutes and 40 seconds, 46 seconds, tried, convicted, sentenced, and executed that man. And if we had better systems in place, we would not have police coming into contact as frequently with poor black and brown communities. And those interactions can escalate in an instant and result in harm. So I wanna say that I am hopeful, um, but I am exhausted with respect to where we find ourselves. Um, and I expect our white allies, and, and actually I wanna call them unindicted co-conspirators, they need to step up and start owning some of the problems that we are seeing right now. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. I think we have uh, Sunny back. Um, folks, if you have questions, can dial star three to get in the question queue. Um, Sunny, are you back? I am back. Uh, can you hear me? I'm only back uh, by phone, and I apologize for that. But can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm very sorry about my problems that I'm having. Uh, my internet is down, and so um, I am calling in. But uh, I'm thrilled to be a part of this, and I, I miss a lot of what was said. Uh, in, in terms of the reflections, but uh, I, I, I heard the last part of it, and it's, um, you know, certainly um, I, I think that we are experiencing what I don't think is a moment in our society, but I do think it's a movement uh, long overdue, because as uh, someone just said, and forgive me because I just caught it, the system is working as it was designed, and it is time for the system uh, to be changed certainly to be gutted. And we're here to talk about the legal perspective, right, on the global public health crisis, the rebellion I think we're seeing, not just the protests, and the incidence of hate crimes, which have really laid bare these disparities and just the systemic racism that we see present throughout our country. Um, I also uh, learned that the real, uh, the news today is that the U.S. set a record for new cases of COVID, 38,672 just today. The previous record in, was April uh, 25th at 36,001. And I also learned that uh, President Trump wants to cut federal funding for testing amid the fact that we have mm -hmm. now spikes of COVID in 26 states. And we know that our community, the black community, is the community that has been hit hardest by this global pandemic, by COVID. And so I want to ask all of you, um, let's start with uh, Attorney General um, Tish James, is this just a moment or is this a movement? And what can we do? What can you do um, to effect change in your sphere, in your area as the Attorney General for my home state of New York. Thank you, Sonny, for that question. I've been tasked with the responsibility of investigating NYPD um, in their interactions with protesters over these last few days. Um, last week, I had three days of hearings, over 100 witnesses, 300 individuals have submitted testimony, videos, pictures, um, and, uh, and recordings. In addition to that, the police commissioner came before me this past Monday where I had the opportunity to ask him questions. And the testimony of the police commissioner stands in stark contrast to those of the protesters. And so as a result of that, I will be issuing findings and recommendations to the governor of the state of New York, as well as to the mayor of the city of New York on ways to reform uh, the police department. But part of it has to do with culture. 
and a mindset. And as was mentioned earlier, everyone needs to go back and review history and talk about and learn more about uh, the color of law since the beginning, since we landed here 400 years ago and how the color of law has always been, unfortunately, uh, has included, um, has been, uh, has been affected um, by race um, and in some cases gender, but for the most part, uh, race is incorporated into our laws each and every day. It's important that we have a police force, not only in New York, but all across this nation that recognizes the humanity of all of God's children. It's important that we put forth legislation as we did here in the state of New York to ban chokeholds and other types of restraint, that we have transparency, we repealed Article 15A, which is a law in the state of New York, which will now allow the public um, to see uh, the personnel records of the disciplinary records of police officers in the state of New York. We have also codified in law a provision which would allow my office to inve investigate um, deaths of individuals who are both armed and unarmed in the state of New York. Um, and in the aftermath of the incident, that all of us witnessed in Central Park where a woman basically weaponized race um, against a young man who was a bird watcher simply because he urged this woman to put her dog on a leash. Um, that is now a crime and it will also be a civil rights violation as well. Um, and so we are can end last but not least the city council in the city of New York um, based upon um, a recommendation that I make. We now have a tracking system, a warning system, a risk assessment system for police officers who continue to get to have complaints filed against them in the city of New York. Um, the investigation that I uncovered unfortunately detailed some very alarming um, facts and that is police officers use their batons, use pepper spray, um, injured individuals, use their cars as weapons, um, hid their name tags and their badge numbers against peaceful protesters. And so um, we need to, again, defend the right to protest. We need to put forth reforms. But all of those, all of those young people who are marching tonight, not too far from where I live, uh, Barclay Center has become a center of action. They are marching in the streets and they should continue to march. And we all must be reminded of the fact that the civil rights movement, the Montgomery boycott lasted almost 300 days. Let them march, let their voices be heard and let's listen to them and let's enact reform. Now is the time to be bold. Now is the time to stand up and speak truth to power. And now is the time to recognize that racism, systematic racism is something that has infected our laws for far too long and the change and change is needed now. And so I applaud all of those young people, white, black, Latino, and Asian who are marching each and every day. I stand with them, will defend them and urge them to continue to march on until we see some change in the system. Thank you for that. Uh, let me let me turn also to um, Dis District Attorney Rollins because I've heard uh, across the country you have many prosecutors, chief prosecutors, that are saying when protesters are arrested by the police, they are not going to be prosecuted. And that goes a long way, I think, to enforcing um, and protecting, really, their right to protest and to assemble. Uh, what can you do and what are you doing in Suffolk County uh, here in New York to protect protesters? We have made it very clear even prior to George Floyd's uh, murder, lynching, um, that we were going to um, happily allow individuals to exercise their First Amendment rights. Um, we got a lot of uproar recently, right after uh, the murder of George Floyd, when individuals started looting or burning you know, a police car, and those are property crimes. Um, yes, they will be held accountable for that, but I'm always fascinated when people are more outraged that glass and buildings are broken um, then bones and humans are killed. Um, and the people screaming for peace um, after communities have witnessed executions um, over and over and over again, I ask, what are you doing for justice? So we have made it very clear, um, only unless they are violent and serious crimes, we will not be prosecuting individuals that are peacefully protesting. And 
Um, I'm proud that we have several other individuals um, in my position around the country that are uh, doing the same. And, and let me turn then also to um, State Attorney Mosby. What is your position um, in Baltimore? Because certainly you have had the experience uh, after Freddie Gray's death and having to, um, I think that was in 2015 because I was working for CNN and I was on the ground then, um, having the experience of, of dealing with protests um, and, and protests turning um, somewhat violent. So the one thing I can say um, is that just like my colleague Rachel, even in 2015, one of the things that we knew right away is that we weren't gonna be prosecuting individuals for merely protesting. If it went something beyond, um, you know, destruction of, of breaking and entering and actually burning down, you, you know, the, the pharmacy, that's something different. But when it comes to the mere protesting and exercising your first amendment right, that was something that we, from the very jump in 2015, was very clear about we are beating these protesters by our arrest. And I could say a lot about our self-proclaimed law and order president that seems to be pouring gas onto the flames of hate and bigotry in, in, in this country, trying to distract from his incompetency and mishandling of a global pandemic impacting our people. But I mean, and I could wish that we had somebody in this position and in this moment that can meet the challenge, but we don't. And, and, and the real leaders, as I've stated before, are those that are demanding change. Those protesters that are out there, white, black, Latino that are saying this is has to stop. This historically has disproportionately, this system has been set up to impact black people and it's it has to stop. And so as the prosecutor, one of the things that I can now appreciate from the conservative approach um, is states' rights. Um, you know, under, the federal system is not able to impose their egregiousness uh, from immigration policies to their egregiousness and attempting to reimpose the death penalty on distribution cases um, and to not want to hold police officers accountable. As I stated in my opening, you cannot underestimate the power and discretion of a prosecutor. So what I intend to do is what I've been doing for the past five years, which is to apply one standard of justice to all, regardless of race, sex, religion, and occupation. And even despite the hate mail, the death threats, the mocking, the ridicule, I'm going to do my job because that's what the people of the city of Baltimore have elected me to do, to apply that one standard of justice. And I can tell you that that accountability, which you know, at least when I did it in 2015, and the AP just put out a, a poll that has said that the perception of racism and policing in this country for Americans has changed drastically since the time that uh, five years ago when I charged those officers, even though that has changed, it still takes a great deal of, of courage to be able to do that. You see my colleague in Minneapolis who pointed me out five years later and has used me as an example as to why to deflect from his inaction and his ability to do his job. The I, one thing that I want to point to is that is incredibly important. That accountability led to exposure. A week after I charged those officers in the Freddie Gray case, the Department of Justice came in, exposed the discriminatory policing practices of the eighth largest police department in the country. That exposure ultimately led to reform. We now have a federally enforceable consent decree that even despite the Trump administration that tried to forestall it, is still on record. And because of that, reform, we have a spotlight on the entrenched police corruption. So it starts with accountability. And so it, it, there are systems that exist outside of the courtroom that need to change. And that's what we should be talking about legislatively. There are systems in place, as my colleague already eloquently uh, articulated, there are crimes that we should not be prosecuting. And we, as we think about reimagining what public safety and policing looks like in this country, you should not be dead because you attempting get to passwords. pass a counterfeit $20 bill. Again. You should not be dead because you failed to put on a turn signal. You should not be dead because you are allegedly selling a loose cigarette. And so it's incumbent on prosecutors in these positions to reevaluate the types of crimes that create these engagements and these hostile engagements between communities of color and law enforcement. And again, you are absolutely right, Sonny. It is not just a moment 
but in it is a movement, but in this moment, we should be reevaluating our role as prosecutors to do such. And Sonny, can I just add something really quickly, if you don't mind? What I know the police are getting uh, are getting lots of um, criticism, and and it is deserved as well. But I think State's Attorney Mosby and myself, um, and even the Attorney General, can say. DAs are just as guilty, I believe. No, we are not physically killing people like we've seen a Derek Chauvin do, but when you willfully look away and refuse to prosecute, that enables bad behavior, right? Um, and that has happened with Ahmad Arbery, all right? We had three different district attorneys that watched that video of Travis McMichael shooting Ahmad after they hunted him, him and his father and their co-conspirator or joint venturer and shot him dead. Three DAs watched that video and said, nope, this looks great. Georgia has a citizen's arrest statute. I'm fine. And oh, by the way, the first DA worked with Travis's father for two decades, right? So this is deeply ingrained. Um, and the strength and courage of my sister, Marilyn, to stand up with a backbone of steel and, and charge those officers, I, I'm getting goosebumps now and I'm old enough, I feel like to be her mom. But I remember watching, I remember where I was when I watched that gorgeous face step up and announce that they were charging those officers. Um, and that is who we need running for these positions. Exactly. Thank you. I wanna turn to, uh, I believe we have an audience question. Can yes, we have, yes, we have uh, Christine from Alexandria, Virginia. Christine, go ahead with your question. Yes, someone mentioned earlier about moving from protest to policy, and I think that's very important. My question, however, is what the leadership at NAACP is doing to ensure that not only black lawyers are included at the table to plan litigation strategies internally, but also, you know, our white brothers and sisters and those of other races who we've seen at the protest on our behalf all over the world. And I just think it's very important to have a dialogue, you know, at, at the NAACP leadership level about how we will proactively include persons of all races who want to help us and work with us and plan and strategize on how to dismantle injustice in this country and, and, and around the world. President Johnson, can you take that question? Muted. You're muted. We have President You're muted. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Yes, yeah, right. There are no shortage of, of lawyers that we work with across the country. Uh, we have an ongoing relationship with the National Bar Association. We participate actively with black bars in different states. Uh, uh, and in fact, we have more opportunity to be engaged and we have lawyers available to assist. Uh, we will be working with a set of criminal justice lawyers to roll out a, uh, to build out a task force to talk about what the federal policy should look like, uh, particularly with qualified immunity, what everyone is uh, currently talking about. But also, uh, there was a concerted effort to take uh, resources out of the practice of criminal law, particularly in African American communities, uh, by uh, putting in place levels of tort reform so you could not bring uh, civil actions in some jurisdictions. Uh, for the NAACP, uh, we are always welcoming lawyers to. Partner with, partner with us, bring us uh, uh, theories that we could pursue. Uh, so we're open. Uh, we need more lawyers, and we're not trying to be exclusionary in any in, in any way. Now, the reason why we have the head of the National Bar Association on this line is because of the partnership we have with NBA, uh, and so we'll we'll welcome any lawyer, black, white, green, and yellow, to assist. I mean, I I think the question presumes that the NAACP consists of only black lawyers. And that's just not true at all. And the reality is, is if you look um, again, the past is a prologue to the future. 
If you look at the civil rights movement, it wasn't just black attorneys who were in the forefront of the struggle. It was also white lawyers and particularly Jewish lawyers. My office, I have over 18 attorneys. The majority of them, since I've just got elected, are white, but we are trying to diversify our ranks. And all of them are committed to, again, addressing reform and putting forth legislative proposals, both on the state level and on the city, city, city level, because they are all committed to one simple concept. And that concept is something that I um, mandate in, throughout my office. And that is nothing but sweet justice, sweet and simple justice. And so it's really critically important that individuals understand that reform is going to take the shape of a lot of different attorneys, of different races and ethnicities and, and orientations, but it all should lead to one goal, and that is reform, reforming a system which unfortunately is entrenched and a system which unfortunately is infected with racism and that virus needs to be cut out. Thank you. I, I think couldn't we have have said it better. Question. That's right. <laughs> I think we have another So the one thing question. I would add, I would, can I just say add one? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yes, you can go. No, I was going to add. Yes, please, please. I was just going to add that there are already one of the things that I think that we have to recognize is that when you do have the prosecutors or attorney generals that are willing to be courageous enough to do their jobs, um, there are a, a number of hurdles and barriers that are put in place by the culture of policing and, and quite frankly, um, the police unions in this country, um, and. The one thing that I think that we could do a better job of doing is ensuring coordination for those individuals that do their job and do it the way that they, the people in the community do them to do it. You know, I didn't go far. It did. It went too far. But having the 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 arm of the NAACP to support that, um, you know, suit, and it would have been hu 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 enormous. It could have been huge. Um, Kim Gardner is currently going through, you know, some of the barriers that have been put in place in in in, in St. Louis as a re direct result of the police unions that are coming against her for doing her job. And so I think that there are, are ways and room for us to be able to support those of us that are pushing against the status quo. And I just hope that you guys are open to, and, and I'm, I'm most certainly, most certain you guys are, um, to ensuring that for those individuals that are doing the job, we have the, the proper support. Um, I, I do believe we have another audience question. We do. So we have Sean in Atlanta. Sean, go ahead with your question. Yes, thank you so much for, for taking my question. I greatly appreciate it. And, and hats off to, to the years of great service from the NAACP. I'm proud to be a member. Uh, my question, since we have so many attorneys on the line, uh, I've really been wanting to ask this question. How is it that, that Trump is, isn't being held liable? How is it that more attorneys uh, across the nation are talking about criminal negligence on behalf of, uh, of Donald Trump? All of us obviously see that this pandemic has, has been woefully his efforts have been woefully inept and, and to the point that i believe that there that he is guilty of, of of criminality so how is it that we are talking about criminal negligence on his part from from not requiring that people wear masks rushing to open up different parts of the country to getting on stage and mocking people either wearing masks or saying he's going to take hydrochloroquine or he is taking it or other people should take it how is it that criminal negligence isn't being discussed ad nauseum, ad nauseum about this, about this man and his response to this pandemic? Thank you. Uh, who would like to take that question? Uh, Attorney General James? I can yeah, take it. So let me go oh. ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. I'm Robinson, how are you? Uh, yes. <laughs> let me, let me say that we were taking this on, uh, uh, on on yesterday, I, along with uh, 65 of the uh, members of the GW faculty, actually sent a uh, a condemnation uh, statement out about Barr that also included um, uh, very strong recommendations regarding Trump 
influence, undue influence, and unlawful influence uh, involving the attorney general. Uh, with respect to these other issues, uh, I've established at the National Bar Association two task force. Uh, one was for COVID-19, which is very aggressively attacking all of these issues. And then uh, number two, uh, uh, two uh, is, a, is the NA, NBA Police Misconduct and Judicial Reform Justice Reform Task Force. Understand that we are focused on reform and what we do best is lawyers make permanent the changes that people seek so that what we need to do is we need to get legislation passed and it uh, seems to me all the things that we're concerned about and that study you mentioned i'm sorry we got disconnected you mentioned bar uh, not, not bar trump deciding to end today um the um, places where one could get free testing. There is no mm -hmm. reason why we cannot demand that our legislators provide funding directly for that because we know our communities need to have funding for these clinics that they don't have to pay for where they can be tested. When we talk about those things that are wrong in the criminal justice system, then we need to file suits, we need to pressure our legislators, and we can defund, and when we say defund, we're not talking about doing away with police. What we're talking about is to take certain resources and out of a very bloated police system, and place it where we need it. I agree. This is not happenstance. Uh, it, it, there's a new discussion, and I've written about this extensively, about reparations. We have to understand we were brought to this country to work for free. And we were therefore a commodity. And there's nothing in this system that was created that was intended for us to be equal to others so that we have to move from, we've got passion and we're upset about things to really forcing our legislators to do that which we have put them in office to do and to demand that our tax dollars, our tax dollars be used to improve our communities and we can always, at the federal level, tie any funding to states and municipalities, certain police reform and other reforms that we need across the board, all aspects of our life. We can tie federal funding to measurable improvements and changes so that when I say I'm optimistic because we can't just be passionate about this, we've got to act like we've got to own it. From my perspective, yeah, it takes us to have hard conversations with colleagues, but we also have to ensure that we are holding accountable our legislators all up and down the ballot, and going and demanding that certain things happen at the municipal level. And when we, we, we push forward, and when you say, where are the lawyers? The lawyers are here. But, but you can't say it's only the lawyers that have to do it. The lawyers speak power, truth to power. But the passion in the street right now is speaking truth to power as well. And so together, Together, we can make change happen and we can support these prosecutors who are working hard to enact change because we control who is in office. We have to control how our money is spent, how our tax can dollars. Can I add something? 
Yes. Um, may, so one of the things I'm proud of as DA, so ways that we can do that, real live examples, is um, shortly after I took office on January 2nd, 2019, we sued ICE. And so even hmm. though I understand Trump can be, you know, raining down on us and whoever the attorney general is now, first it was Sessions, now it's Barr, there might be a new one before we're done with this tonight. Um, but we sued ICE because ICE was coming into courthouses and there are churches, schools, um, hospitals, and courthouses are four places where people should be able to go and tell the truth. No matter what it is that they've done, they shouldn't be fearful. Um, you need bold leadership to do things like that. We won a preliminary injunction. Um, we are waiting for the results of a declaratory judgment. So we won the battle, but not the war yet. Um, we're certainly happy to be in the role of um, defending the position of the judge as opposed to trying to overturn what a judge has done. Um, but we are the first place in the United States of America where ICE is no longer allowed to go in and make civil arrests inside of courthouses. We're proud that the attorney, uh, the US, I'm sorry, the, the DA in Brooklyn, New York, just filed a lawsuit as well. I think the attorney general knows that. And they just got a very good result in New York. So there are ways that lawyers can start chipping away at this individual, this occupant of the White House in some of the most egregious policies that he's done, or in particular, just immediately coming into office in Jeff Sessions, removing all of the power of the Department of Justice to do pattern and practice investigations into police departments. So that's what state's attorney Marilyn Mosby was talking about. My background was as a US uh, assistant US attorney. Those pattern and practice investigations are able to hold those police departments hostage, essentially responsible and not give them federal funding if they don't comply with um, what moderators have to do or monitors. Um, with respect to consent decrees through courts. There's all this oversight and they immediately withdrew all of that um, once Trump got into office. I think it just exacerbates and shows us how important it is that we vote um, to get somebody into the White House that understands the importance of the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Justice. Well, I agree I with all of that. I'm glad we're having that conversation. But let me just say, I think we Let only just have another, am I right? We have another 10 minutes. Um, okay. And w one of the things that we do have coming up, uh, we, we have our election coming up. So one way that we do hold Trump account accountable is that we, we vote him out of We office. vote. Um, <laughs> we vote, exactly. Um, I, I, wanna, uh, I, I want to give all of you um, the opportunity to just have a closing reflection but one thing that we haven't talked about, and I think it was um, State's Attorney Mosby brought it up, this notion of reimagining public safety um, and, you know, what we, we're seeing in terms of the protests, we're seeing people ask for the defunding of the police. And um, I, I ask all of you, what does that mean? Because it has been something that has been out there for a very long time. In my view, it doesn't mean abolishing the police. It means reimagining uh, public safety. So I, I, I throw it out to, to all of you um, to hopefully consider that, uh, answering that question when you do give your closing reflections. What do you see in terms of reimagining public safety, defunding the police? What does that mean to you? Um, and ultimately, how do we ensure that our voices are heard this election? Because we do know that there is a significant amount of voter suppression that will be happening, especially targeting black and brown communities. Let me just well, say this. Like Let me just again respond to the previous question, and that is whether or not the president is guilty of uh, a criminal negligence. The elements of criminal negligence are, are not there. Um, but as you know, my office, along with uh, the former U.S. Attorney General, U.S. Attorney, uh, Mr. Berman, were engaged in certain activities. And those activities will continue under the new U.S. Attorney, Ms. Audrey Strauss. 
Um, and as, as you also know, that there have been several cases filed against the President of the United States for a violation of the Emoluments Clause. I want to thank my colleague in D.C., Carl Racine, for bringing that case, uh, which is currently pending. Um, and um, my colleague in Massachusetts mentioned the case that I filed with my friend and colleague, the Brooklyn District Attorney, Eric Gonzalez, where we successfully won to kick ICE out of the courts. We have been successful in a number of lawsuits against this administration. In fact, over 85 percent of the cases that I have filed against this president, we have won. They include attacks against our environment and attacks against women, attacks against immigrants, wide range of attacks because I use the law both as a sword and as a shield. And it's important that we underscore the notion that no one is above the law, including the president of these United States. But right now we've got to join together uh, again to fight back against voter suppression. We saw a little hints of that yesterday in primary day here in New York, which was a forerunner to what's, what will happen in November. But um, what I will be doing is urging all of my staff members um, and giving them some time off and training them to go out there and be monitors and to assist states all across this nation in ensuring that an individual's right to vote, a basic and fundamental part of our democracy is protected. That is most critically important. We've got to organize, organize, and organize and focus on the elections in November so that we can return, we can return decency um, and the rule of law uh, to uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. We become the laughing stock of the world. And it's important that we return to normalcy. Um, yeah, we return to normalcy because this president, unfortunately, um, does not understand the values of our country, does not recognize the contributions of immigrants, unfortunately, treats women like second class citizens, uh, is destroying our environment, and again, is caused havoc um, to those individuals. Um, who rely upon the Affordable Care Act, who have pre-existing conditions. He does not believe in science. He is someone who is incompetent, as was mentioned, and he is a totally disrespectful to all of us and is not worthy of serving as the president of these United States. It's time that we stand up, fight back, and take back our country. Thank you so much. Wait, isn't it 1600 Black Lives Matter Avenue now? Yay! Yes, it is. <laughs> I love it. It's Plaza. Plaza. Let me say that I, I completely agree with you. Uh, at the National Bar, we started uh, last year with the plan under uh, our president-elect. I charged her with, we have a 50-state strategy which, that we nicknamed the beast, which is to uh, go to every state and protect the vote vote security, et cetera. And so we know we need to change the occupant in the White House. But let's, let's not forget that we have to stay vigilant and we have to call out and demand that, that the Attorney General Barr cease and desist politicizing the Department of Justice. I worked at the Department of Justice and he can do extraordinary damage between now and election day with the president uh, to assure that not all of our votes will be counted. And so while we're looking to that election day and all of us need to lean in on that, I completely agree. But let's not forget that the attorney general is engaged in supporting the president under a theory of the unitary executive. Don't have time to talk about that, but we have to ensure that in these few months that he does not take away the right to vote from the population that he believes he will not get the vote. So just keeping our eye on the prize, that's what we're doing at the National Bar, in addition to preparing to um, and, and looking at all of the election shenanigans, but also watching what the um, attorney general is doing in his current office, which undermines the right to vote. And I guess I'll interject at this point. The one thing I, I you know, I, when we talk about having the courage to do your job um, and pushing back against the status quo, I think that's the first step. Um, but when we really wanna talk about police accountability in the courtroom, uh, you know, there are certain things that have to take place. 
one of which is that there should be independent police agencies that are investigating these misconduct cases in the courtroom, right? Like before we get to the courtroom, it should not be officers investigating themselves. We, I can tell you that that is extremely problematic. Um, and it was a problem and a challenge that we had in the Freddie Gray case and one that a number of my colleagues have on a day-to-day -day basis. The other sort of reform inside the courtroom that you're, you're up against in securing convictions, and I tell you this because we're gonna be awaiting you know, the trials in, in both the Brooks case, as well as the George Floyd case in Minneapolis. But the other sort of concern that we have is that oftentimes police circumvent the communities that they serve and they elect a bench trial, as opposed to being accountable to the communities that they serve. In certain states, you have to get the, the prosecutor and the bench to agree. We should watch out for whether or not in these two cases, the, the police officers circumvent the, the, the communities that they come from because they believe that they'll get deferential treatment from the judge. The last thing in the courtroom and reform that we should be looking to, to impose is changing that culture of the blue wall of silence. I live in Baltimore City, which is the home of witness intimidation where the stop snitching mentality began. But I can tell you that the irony of it all is that there's also a real blue wall of silence where colleagues do not want to um, testify against one another. And I'm grateful that we can point to tangible reforms that have been put in place after the charges in Freddie Gray, one of which is the affirmative obligation for an officer to intervene when their fellow officers cross the line. But there are still systems in place that prevent police accountability, like the, the contractual obligations of law enforcement bill of rights that ties the police department's hands when they want to get rid of rogue officers, ensuring that we have processes and, and systems in place that we know when we have problematic officers. It, the officer in Minneapolis had 18 internal affairs complaints. It's rather foreseeable that he would be a problematic officer. We need systems in place like a majority civilian participation on the administrative trial hearings. And these are sort of tangible reforms that we should be working towards. But when you ask the question about reimagining policing, and public safety. For me, what that means is that for far too long in our society, we have relied on the police to respond to every social ill of our society. We have criminalized every social ill of our society, and most often it's criminalizing poor black and brown people. We need to use this opportunity to reimagine policing and reduce the role of police in our society. And the way that you can do that is to divest resources from the police into community-oriented solutions. One of the things that I know that Rachel Rollins has done when she first came into office was to evaluate the types of cases and crimes that we're prosecuting. We should not be putting the lives of Black people in jeopardy because we're dis it, they're being disproportionately enforced against, laws are being disproportionately enforced against Black people and generate an interaction with police that has nothing to do with public safety, right? And we've already talked about, you know, allegedly passing a counterfeit bill turning, uh, not putting on your turn signal. You know, these are all crimes that we should be reevaluating as to whether or not this is even a public safety concern. And, and last but certainly not least, police are not the experts in these, these what is really public health issues for substance use disorder, homelessness. You know, during COVID, one of the things that I came out and said is that we're not prosecuting substance use disorder. And so we're not prosecuting drug, drug possession and prostitution. The, having the the courage to be able to say that but also ensuring that we support those in, individuals that come to those those conclusions and, and last but certainly not least investing in people and organizations that are experts in dealing with these social ills of society and and understanding and recognizing that it shouldn't be the police so really quickly and i'll i know we're a couple minutes over but to put some meat on those fabulous bones that uh the state's attorney just said when you talk about bench trials, that means there's no jury. In Massachusetts, for example, in Superior Court, which is where our most violent, serious crimes are, there are over 80 Superior Court judges, only three of them are black, right? So if white officers are harming or using excessive force on black individuals and go for a bench trial, they are far more likely to get a white peer, a former prosecutor that is now a judge, um, that is going to hear that case. Number one, to also quote state's attorney uh, Mosby, the blue wall of silence is the best no snitching policy I've ever seen or heard of in my life. Okay. Derek Chauvin, 
18 violations in his background. If you or I worked at Sephora and had three write-ups, we wouldn't work at Sephora anymore. Why is it that we allow police officers that are the only part of our government that has the ability, the lethal and legal authority to kill you without having to stop and pick up a phone and get pr approval? They can kill you. And we allow people with this many violations to continue working there. It's outrageous. If we think about how do we keep communities healthy and safe, the answer isn't police. It's better schools. It's greener spaces it's no environmental racism it's a lot of different things so our budgets guys are a value statement so if we look and see that education and the police are the two highest funded different sectors in our cities or towns or municipalities um when we look at education in massachusetts we spend about fifteen thousand dollars per student for education but when we send you to jail we will have no problem spending fifty-five to a hundred thousand dollars a year to send you to jail. Those numbers should be switched, right? So, what I have done in Massachusetts and Suffolk County is on June eleventh, I wrote a letter to all of the chiefs of my police departments in Suffolk County, the colonel of the state police, as well as the commissioner of the Boston police. Um, I will not read you the whole thing, but I said the world is watching and reacting, not only to the harm and violence we witnessed on Memorial Day, but also to the systemic and systematic oppression of black people that has been going on for centuries. And I called them, I ordered them to a meeting um, where on Thursday, June 18th, we were gonna share a meal and speak with candor and in confidence about where we find ourselves in this pivotal moment and most importantly, where we intend to be moving forward together. I asked them for their guidance and leadership and collaboration and said it was critical and mandatory for us to be there. And believe you me, we had an incredibly emotional and raw conversation to try to get our house in order. We are never gonna be in full agreement, but they are going to listen to me as the elected chief, uh, law enforcement officer in Suffolk County, the first woman to ever have this job and the first woman of color in the history of the Commonwealth. But we are gonna have tough conversations. We need the police at the table, um, but they are going to have to significantly reduce their budget. There should be no money militarizing them. And they are gonna have to really be uh, take a long, hard look at the gravy train that they've had for quite some time but I am optimistic with the changes that are coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, President Johnson, would you like to uh, give some final remarks? Wow, if there was ever a time to trust black women, this is a great example why we should trust black women. Uh, we are in the midst of uh, a wake up call. Uh, that wake up call is to see that elections actually have consequences. Uh, there is no more uh, election that is as important as the election of district attorney. Uh, the district attorney in Georgia that refused to bring the case uh, as related to Ahmaud Arbery uh, is on a ballot this year. And so for our members and for those who are seeking justice uh, in Georgia, uh, we got to go out to the polls. Uh, the district attorney in Minneapolis uh, was elected. He is elected. He's decided that he's siding with uh, corrupt police as opposed to the citizens that elected him. Uh, we got to go to the polls uh, in Minneapolis. The district attorney who's refused to bring the case against the officers who murdered Breonna Taylor in her bed uh, as they executed a defective warrant for an individual they had in custody uh, will probably be on the ballot this year. Uh, we must go out to the polls and vote. Uh, I can recall in 2015 when, when a group of us began to talk about zeroing in on certain elections, then we realize that the discretion of district attorneys is something that we need to take note. Uh, in many cases, we cannot change public policy because state legislative bodies are entrenched uh, because of the, the type of money that flows from private prisons and other industries that, that are well-funded as a result of mass incarceration of our community. We did recognize the power of district attorney, and you heard that power today, tonight on the call. Uh, for the NAACP, uh, elections have consequences and we're taking it so serious that all of our focus is on November. 
November election would allow us to not only change the culture by which we operate, it can uh, add a level of protection for all the members in the communities that we serve. So join, uh, join us in the opportunity to serve our community so we can provide the necessary protections uh, by turning out to the polls in November because elections have consequences. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you to all of the panelists this evening. Uh, we look forward to you all joining us on our next Teleton Hall meeting. Uh, we really appreciate the support that, that uh, the listening audience have provided to the NAACP. At 101 years old, we must continue to fight to ensure democracy works for all and that we can truly enjoy equal protection under the law. Have a good night. Good night.